Attention all you rule breakers, you misfits and troublemakers, all you free spirits and pioneers, all you visionaries and nonconformists. Everything the establishment has told you is wrong with you is actually what's right with you. You see things others don't. You are hardwired to change the world. Okay, today we're going to be interviewing an old friend that we haven't seen each other for quite a while, Athena Dimitrios. You have that correct. And uh, we're going to be talking about your new book, Walking Between Worlds. And before we get into that, I'd, I'd like to just sort of say one thing here. Um, I noticed from what I've read so far, mm -hmm. you've made a pretty good clarification between something that I see really gets people confused. When I was uh, doing some... Um, counseling with adolescents going mm -hmm. through drug recovery, they would come in and they'd say, Rahasia, man, this, this world is so fucked up, the government's fault, and my uncle and aunt, and they're, they're. they blame everybody, everybody. So I'd always wait till I had them all together in a group and, and I'd tell them a story, ask them a question. And I, I'd say, okay, guys, if I, if I got you all together, took off all your clothes, your shoes, everything, threw you in the back of the van, drove you 500 miles out in the middle of the desert, pushed you out and drove off. Whose fault is it? They go, well, it's your fault, Gracia. Whose problem is it? And they would stop and they'd realize what they've been doing that, oh wait, yeah, it's their fault, but it's my problem. That's right. And at that point, we could start doing some meaningful group work because it, the complaining was over. Forget them. You know, you're on your own here. You That's know, I, true. I tell them, you, you need how to, they were always crying out for justice. And I said, you have justice. You just have to learn how to spell it. Right. Just us. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's just us. That. And we, I think we've learned that justice, here in paradise justice. too, you yeah. know. Like I, I'm putting in a water system, a 2,500 gallon water tank, a fire hose, because I, I know if the fire comes, it's just me. It's just us. I, yeah. I better be really well prepared, you know. So why don't you start out by, uh, and another thing too, from, from what you're saying in mm -hmm. here, I think it would help a lot of people to handle trauma and not suppress it. Mm. I see a lot of suppression going on with, with their trauma. Right. And, you, and you can't blame them, you know, because uh, everybody wants to suppress it, drug it out, whatever you want to do to not think about it. But the problem is it's there, you know. Why don't you, why don't you start from that point of view? Okay. Well, suppressing trauma, and I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. But I think it's natural because it's so uncomfortable but it always left me with the very deep-seated feeling that life was not meant to be lived like this. It didn't feel natural to me. I <clears throat> certainly had no concept of God or goddess all that is or source energy. None of that. That wasn't a point of reference. But it was the feeling, it was the emotion that I had. And having experienced trauma as a child and People experience trauma in so many different ways. I think it it takes courage to want to go back and look at something in order to heal and to become more whole. And that's really why I went on that journey, because I was willing to do anything that I had to do to learn how to redefine the way I saw life way I interacted with people. It was so hard to let people really get close because I think it's natural to put up a wall. I can't let someone touch my heart. I'll get hurt if I do. So that was really looking through the prism of the way I defined life through the eyes of a child, through my experiences. That became the distorted lens. And I always say it was like uh, looking at the world with butter on a pair of glasses. You know, I just wasn't uh, seeing clearly. And I also feel like 
you know, if one wants to have any kind of relationship that has uh, some intimacy to it, then I think it's important to do that kind of work. With that, I would say that it is very, very important to choose a very qualified therapist. Don't just be willing to turn it over to anybody. Do your homework and really research. And when you find somebody that you feel aligned with, then that's a good thread to pull on. The other part of that is it's a process. Don't expect that it's going to happen overnight because it won't. But if you allow yourself to uh, explore the anger with it, the rage that comes with it, it all comes with it, um, the grief and the loss and the acceptance of the loss, eventually that moves into its own phase, but it takes its own time and, and its own space. And I just can't say how strongly I feel that someone needs a really qualified therapist to help navigate the storm. But there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure being a male, I can totally uh -huh. identify with what females go through in a patriarchal society. But uh -huh. We have somebody giving um, meditations here. She was in the military and was heavily sexually abused. Right. Dar is giving a session today to somebody that was in the military, heavily sexually abused. Uh huh. Wow. So it, it's not only the trauma, but there's very few support systems out there. Matter of fact, some of the organizations not only encourage you, but it's developed to not let you speak about your trauma. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's like... The, the patriarchal part of our society really shows up in the military for obvious reasons. Yeah, but of course. It's all through the educational system, the United Nations. I, I've been reading a lot about the human trafficking. Oh. And the only way it can happen, Athena, is if the United Nations is on board, which they've been caught at, uh -huh. the Red Cross, all of these help organizations that we really think deep down inside, there's a lot going on that's really dark, and the only way that can happen that's is fine. if it's supported from the very highest levels. Right. You know, so, yeah, I, I, I can't imagine the, I know I'm being married for over 20 years and really caring about my mm -hmm. wife sort of gives me a peek into that, you know, but, you know, the, the things that you talk about in this book is really, really important. Well, and, you know, I think, you know, with the military or with any organization where it's oppressed, when someone experiences something like that, there's such a feeling of powerlessness that you don't have the power to change the situation. And that, along with shame, because there's a level of shame that just, like I say, it really just seems to stain the soul. And to talk to somebody about that is very uncomfortable. And people are uncomfortable listening about it. And then many times you can be speaking to somebody and they've had their own experience that it kind of stirs that up a little bit. But you're right, just to get it up to the surface so it can be looked at and dealt with. And that's why... It's, you know, the Me Too movement is, is so huge, human trafficking, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It is. Because, yeah, but I We mean, have to look at it. You know, we have to really keep looking at this stuff and putting a light on it. Yes. Because from what I can tell, right, almost all of the power that governments have, corporations have, comes from being behind a veil of secrecy. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember watching... Um, Wizard of Oz. Oh. Wizard of Oz, <laughs> they're, they're going to the see the wizard, and they're all apprehensive of this wizard. And the, the whole story is about the apprehension of meeting this big, bad, monstrous entity. Right. They get there. It's interesting, a little dog pulled, pulled the curtain back. But once the curtain is pulled back, and they see it's just an old, frail old man pulling levers, right. the whole thing changes. Everything and I think shifts. that's what we're seeing today. You know, a lot of the really deeply embedded organizations from the Catholic Church on, oh, yeah. we're starting to see that these are just a bunch of frail old men trying to hold on to their power through secrecy. Yes, it is. And, and, and it, it, the secret's out, I think. 
secret is out. And just look at the uh, movie Spotlight, what happened yeah. with that. Oh I mean, that was incredible. Yeah. But sometimes it takes a village, but it takes somebody very courageous to really start stirring stirring it up and getting those embers to, you know, to fly out, or fly and begin to ignite something. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, difficult because, one, okay, there, there's a... There's a lot of depth to what we could talk about yeah. that we'll, we'll touch on. But getting people to really look at things, the, the, it's either the cognitive dissonance uh -huh. that allows them to get to the point where they can't understand what's being said, right? or complete blindness. Uh, uh, they turn a blind eye to it. You know, So you almost have to, uh, and this is a good way to do it, you, you almost have to come in subtly with a story right. and there's a lot of emotion in what you say and that's the one thing that people can attach to because their mind doesn't have to be there. As a matter of fact, the mind insists on not being there. And once you connect emotionally right. to where you feel it in your heart, I mean sitting here right now, I can, looking in your eyes, I can feel there's a lot of heartfelt uh, emotion Yes, you know, and I have such empathy for anyone who's walked that journey. I've walked that journey, and I, I know it so well because I've really wrestled that demon to the mat. But I, that was also that uh, part of me that absolutely was not willing to give up on okay. it. I was tenacious with that. And with anybody, it, it, well, let me back up here. Writing the book, for me, really, my deepest desire in writing the book was, and I get a little emotional about this, because when it was finished, it was such a huge accomplishment for me, because the fear factor was so large. What would people think? You know, because it's like taking a magnifying glass and letting people just go in really up close and personal and seeing every flaw, every wrinkle, anything you, you know, would want to normally hide. But I decided, you know, I'm going to be so gut level honest with this because you have to. Why do it otherwise? Yeah. So it's like really allowing somebody to pull back and look into the darkest parts of the good, bad, and the ugly of myself, but the journey and what, you know, and uh, what got me here. But when I finished the book, you know, I have an altar uh, that I, uh, for my meditation, and I put the book on the altar and I said okay God it's in your hands you use it in the most powerful way possible to touch people and so that's and I feel that deeply about it I can see that too. I do I do you know it's just it, it's that important to me if if it inspires somebody to begin that journey then I'm I'm thrilled and, and then it was worth just one person picking it up so and, and you, you talk it. about having a spiritual experience that sort of catapulted you. What was the experience? Well, having experienced the kind of uh, trauma that I did as, as a young girl, and then going through my teenage years, being very uh, detached and, and cold, always felt for the underdog, but still couldn't get very close to me. But when I hit 32, it was 1979, and it's what I call my defining moment in life. had never studied anything of any spiritual uh, nature at all. But I had three, three experiences hit me within 24 hours. Each one was big in and of itself, and it literally brought me to my knees. And I remember praying, and I said, if life hurts this bad, the cause has to lie within me. And that was the pivotal turning point. The cause has to lie within me. I never knew anything about cause and effect. None of that. I was completely ignorant of any of those basic laws. But that was the turning point. And at that exact moment, I had two visions. One, I saw this filthy black pool. It was like sludge in one hand. And I knew that represented all of my experiences and how I had treated life and what you know what those represented 
And as soon as I made that statement, you know, if life hurts this bad, the cause lies within me. And then all of a sudden I had, had this understanding that happened in a split second. And I remember thinking and saying out loud, oh my God, I understand. And I saw that life had no choice but to come back and that I would experience what I had been creating and sending forth into the world that what was uh, transpiring in the world of other people or how I had uh, touched them. And with that, there was a golden ray that came into my front room and absolutely everything was dusted with gold, everything. And it was at that moment, I thought it was dying. I didn't understand what was happening because nothing in my life remained familiar. Everything changed at that one instant. And after that, uh, I took off psychically like a rocket ship. My experiences began somewhat tumbling over themselves. And then at the same time, I was praying for probably the first, oh, it must have been month, month and a half, the Lord is my shepherd. That was the only <clears throat> prayer I really knew. And uh, there was a, a man who I had just briefly met, instantly liked him. Is this Dr. Peebles? Or? It wasn't Dr. Peebles. I don't know if you, do you remember, his name was Sean Kenny. Sean used to be the, Mar the Winston man oh. with a great big mustache. Do you remember him on billboards everywhere? Yeah. That was Sean. Not a conceited bone in that man's body. Such a beautiful spirit. That was the Marlboro man, right? Uh, actually, he was Winston. Winston? Yeah, I think he was the Winston. But uh, anyway, and I had crossed paths with him. But you know when you meet someone, you have that feeling, oh my God, something about this soul feels so familiar. I feel like I really know this individual on another level. It was that way with Sean. But he handed me three books. And they were the Ascended Master Teachings by St. Germain, the I Am That I Am, which transpired out of Mount Shasta. I picked that up, and I read that first book, and I just broke down and cried like a baby because it was everything I felt in my heart, but I could never find verbalized. And it was just magical. And so I look back at that experience now as um, the most pivotal, but probably the most beautiful and bittersweet of my life that transformed everything. So I began working with it, and I've been a student now of the I Am teachings for about 40 years. Now, is this the same teachings that David Wilcott talks about? I'm not sure. You know, I would like to give you a positive, or, or a, but, you know, I'm not I, sure. It's I'll, the I Am teachings. Well, check it out, because it obviously mm -hmm. sounds like something worth checking out. Oh my gosh. So yeah. what do you think about St. Germain? Oh my God. I um, There's not enough love and there's not enough gold on this planet that would be an equal exchange for what is given to the seeker of light in those books. Do you think he actually is still walking upon the earth as a well, uh, physical uh, being? Or? Well, my understanding is that an ascended master and an ascended master is really someone who's broken the will of re-embodiment, but they have also become master over the human experience. Instead of letting the human experience master them, Christ was an ascended master. And so, you know, with that, uh, Saint Germain appeared to a man on Mount Shasta in the 30s, Godfrey Ray King. And Godfrey Ray King was the seeker of light. And God, <clears throat> when St. Germain appeared to him, he really felt that mankind had to have more than uh, human help if, we, if the planet was going to survive. And so he took it upon himself karmically to awaken the planet to this information. Prior to this, the student was taken into retreats. And after a three-year probationary period, they were given this information by an assisting master. And interesting enough, the word retreat means mighty focus of light. Isn't that beautiful? So, yeah, it's always interesting to see what a word actually Isn't it? means, you know. Yeah. And he, he really gives the student the laws of energy, the understanding 
of where our individualized I am presence is, how to anchor to it. Because he said, you know, your, uh, your attention or our attention is constantly shifting from one side to the other, you know, it, and it runs rampant. He said, like a little tramp dog. And he said, if you don't anchor your attention and know where to anchor it to, then you are going to, well, one has to have the power. It's either the in, inner part of us or the outer, which usually creates all the chaos. Yeah, I know St. Germain, he's one of the people I've read about that mm -hmm. seems to have had a real physical presence on the planet. Oh, yeah. You know, a few centuries ago, and, and the people at the time talk about him. Oh, they yeah. Say, yeah, he, we've seen him 30 years later, and he still looks the same. Yes. You know, there's pretty well Count documented uh, testimonies by people that knew him. And he would just sort of come in and out society, and so yeah. they're, they're, he's one of the people that I think, okay, maybe there's something to this, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, the, what I loved about it, because my life was such a mess, you know, at that time, I was willing to really apply myself. And I remember, I remember him saying or reading, he said, any person that will take 10 minutes and that they spend criticizing other people, places, conditions, or things from being other than what they want them to be and will apply the short meditation, will not need any more proof. They'll have all the proof they need in 10 days. And so I did. And I had all the proof I needed, and so I've been with it ever since. But what he does do is that he works with the students. Every student is different. It's like you may have honed specific uh, uh, either qualities or gifts or characteristics, you know, in this life that I'm struggling to hone. Okay, so every every student is on a different rung of the ladder. So they work with each student on a, they work with them uh, with a, a, an alignment of a, what their specific needs are. And they work with us on the inner planes when we're, we're sleeping. So. Yeah, it's probably the best time to get through to most <laughs> people. A, yeah, that, you know, that's, you know, that's true. So you, you mentioned that um, part of the teaching and part of the awakening through him was he put you in touch with some of the cosmic laws. Cosmic laws. Yeah. And yes, and what made so much sense to me was that I didn't feel in my heart that one could go through and create such chaos and on some level not be accountable. It just never made sense to me. Right. Okay. So with these cosmic laws, he said these laws of energy and vibration, they work whether we're ignorant of them or not. So to learn what they are and how to work with it, and that's what he, you know, that's what he really starts to instruct the students. You know, on, yeah, they're, on that. they're odd too because they're starting to realize that the placebo effect. Uh huh. <clears throat> they always assumed that you'd have a placebo group and a test group, right? You know, a control group. Well, they have always assumed that the placebo group should never know that it's a placebo. Yes. You know, to see, you know, how much that can. Well, recently they found out that they can tell the placebo group it's a placebo. And it makes no difference at all. So it seems like th this idea that we have where we have to really believe something right. when it comes to cosmic laws or, you know, really hard, fast truths of the universe. I guess a personal example of me, I, I had uh, like an allergy problem when uh -huh. I first moved to Chico. I thought, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to live here. Right. You know, two or three weeks, I would just down, you know. And... Uh, one of our advertisers was advertising Nate, N-A-E-T. Huh. And it's like a, a treatment, you know, an energetic treatment. You hold the allergen in your hand, and then they do this little tapping thing. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll try it. Well, that was tapping. Yeah. That's, oh, interesting. Yeah, they have a little thumper uh -huh. that goes up and down your spine, and you do this to your, right. you know. And I did it, I totally didn't believe it. But five treatments later... It not only got rid of my allergies to plants and pollen and all that, I had an allergy to cats, 
we had a cat for like four years after that. You know, I, it doesn't bother me at all. All those allergies just sort of disappeared, and I thought, wow, I, that's strange because I, I thought if it did work, it'd be because I really believed it and psychosomatic, you know, but I didn't believe it at all, and it still works. So that tells me that we're entering into an age of energetic medicine that is working because it's really based upon hard, fast laws of the universe. Right. And as our vibration increases, we're in training to that more and more and more. Yeah. I can see that with our magazine. We're getting more and more energetic healers that are having all kinds of really good results. I was, when I was coming through the Lotus Guide and reading that, you know, it, it's true. There are so many energetic healers in there, and it seems to, it, it, now it seems as if that's the largest part yeah. You know, of the magazine, which is wonderful. Well, and we have one, two, three, four doctors uh -huh. that are PhD medical doctors that have come over to complementary energetic medicine now. Wow. So little by little, the, the doctors are starting to see that, you know, the their therapy might work, but it ends up killing the patient. You know, these pharmaceutical drugs, it, it's coming oh out more God. and more and more. That would be a whole other interview. Yeah, but wouldn't it? If, if <laughs> we just need to start paying attention, and it gets back to just us. We need to start being responsible for our emotions, for our traumas, our life, and the people around us. Well, so well said. And there's, you know, there's so much to that, and just so much to that, that statement. And one of the areas that I was finally able to bridge the cross, where there was two, was forgiveness. And forgiveness, as I always say, from my heart and not my head, because to do so otherwise was really like this empty affirmation that was like, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, but I forgive you with my head and not my heart. Right. So to me, that one really didn't count. The other was the harder to do. But I had an experience when I was working with this hypnotherapist. Uh, that's the tool I chose to go back and look at uh, the trauma. And what was fascinating with that was that I went to the other side of my in-between life. And that was a phenomenal experience. You can't even explain the uh, love and the safety and the awareness, the acute awareness of the soul on that level and I saw my my family and I also saw that there were going to be challenges and I saw this film strip I was surrounded by masters and teachers and they were showing me this uh, big film strip and I, I could see these big they were almost like cement high-rises that would rise out of each in or a frame and maybe there would be like uh, 10 miles in between and another one would come up but I knew those were going to be blockages or um, experiences, growth experiences. But what they were showing me, and I always say this is so important, was they were showing me how I could change in this lifetime. They, they were showing me uh, what could be, and they were showing me what might be, but it was all going to perceive, uh, it was all going to be perceived from uh, my perception, victim or creator, ultimately. That's you know, what it would You know what's like. funny, Athena? Listening to you talk about your experience, mm -hmm. it it parallels so close. Like like Dara and I, we take ayahuasca uh -huh. whenever we go to Brazil. Right. You know, in these ayahuasca journeys, you meet beings that come to you and help. Wow. You know, I, I did uh, DMT once, dimethyltryptamine. Uh huh. And uh, it it was the longest ten minutes of my life, but went into this other complete realm. And what it taught me is even here right now. Mm -hmm. We're talking on this physical level. Right. You know, we're reverberating frequencies. It's hitting my ears, my brain is. But there's another level of communication that goes on. Right. And as you start easing into that, it's awkward at first because there's no linguistic terms sometimes to capture the feelings or the thoughts or the concepts. Yeah. More I, like, I'm seeing more and more talking with people 
like I can tell, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I do. Without talking about it. <laughs> and people listening to this interview, they know exactly what we're talking about also. We're all waking up to this other realm that we've yet to pin down, identify, or conceptually define it. Right. But the ones that are easing into this, we know each other. Oh, yeah. And it, it, it's an innate sense of knowing. It's almost like the pause between the heartbeat, you know, or, or the uh, inhale and then that rest of breath and then the exhale. And it's kind of like that fertile ground in there of that inner knowingness. And I know that when I was able to look back at that experience that I had from that perspective of being on the other side and then wanting to forgive and I thought, oh my God, do I want my mother to be over here and to experience that acute awareness and feel like areas in her life where she missed the mark and could I have done any better? Yeah. And that was, that was the moment for me. And so that was amazing. And then the other one that was difficult to cross was victimhood. Victimhood. But that was, and that was scary because what I really came to terms with is all right, what do I have to blame this on or that on if this didn't happen to me? I could have said, well, I would have been this or I would have been that had this not happened to me. I thought, what if you don't have that? Yeah. And then let go of that crutch and not lean against that? Oh, my God, what a freeing moment that yeah. was. You know, but... And Dr. Peebles, the one that I channeled when I call my mystical muse, he has a statement that I just love. He said, if you're going to feel like a victim, do a good job at it so that you own it and it doesn't own you. Right. It's very truth, you know, great yeah. truth of that. Osho used to say similar things. If, yeah. If you're going to be addicted, you know, encompass it, embrace yeah. it. Yeah, and, so and that you can eventually that's let actually go of it. what I did. I, I had an addiction back in the 70s and into the 80s, you know, cocaine and all that. Yeah. And I wanted to get out of it, but I didn't want to say, hi, my name is blah, blah. Just sure. for today, it would drive me to drink. Right, basically. right. You know, those meetings would actually, it's good for some people. Right. I, I embraced it as a, my addiction as a tool. And I realized after going to India, what I had to do was find something I wanted more than mm. the addiction. Yeah. Because I realized that I'm not a quitter, which is a good motto, but it's also yeah. a problem, you know. But I found something I wanted more, and it was that moment of clarity that it's so fragile. Yeah. I can pull it in right now. I can, right here, right now, I can take a few deep breaths. And you're right there again. And go right there. Yeah. But it, it, your mind comes in and pulls it away so ever gently. Yeah, yeah. And then you're off on this other tangent, <laughs> you know. But yeah. um, I think embracing our traumas and our addictions, and every, we're into a new era, you know, and, and we're being empowered. And that was the other thing. When Dara and I wrote the book, uh, 12 Spiritual Laws, the uh -huh. first law is what you resist persists. The That's first true. law in 12 steps is you give all your power away. Right. And I'm thinking, especially when I was working with the kids, they'd tell me, Rahasia, man, I don't have hardly any power right now. You want me to give the rest of it away? And it dawned on me, we're into a new era. New beings are coming in and going against these old traditionally entrenched systems of becoming disempowered, whether it's the church, the government, your school, the educational system, a lot of these self-help things, they want you to be disempowered. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not there anymore. People's going, oh, wait a minute. I don't think I want to do that, you know? Well, I think that's the awakening. You know, I think that's the that creative spark that's calling people home. And, and when I say home, I, I feel like that there is um, 
well, let me just back up. I would say that. Well, let me back up here. But I have a very clear, distinct memory of being two years old and looking at the stars at night and feeling so homesick and wanting to go home. I didn't know how to get back. It was right. that, that feeling of homesickness. And I just knew that I felt, uh, I, I felt so separated from, well, obviously now I know it was God, that feeling as if, you know, I was part of a bigger all. And uh, so I think that there is that place in our heart that no one else can really feel. I think that's our desire to find that wholeness again and that connection with life and you know, I'll never forget one time. I remember I was working in this uh, salon, and I'll never forget this uh, uh, masseuse came kind of like bouncing down the stairs, all full of life. And I said, you know, how are you treating life? And I'll never forget this. He said, just as good as, or um, how, are you, how are you treating life? And he said, uh, or how's life treating you? And he said, just as good as I'm treating it. Yep. That was a great statement. I never forgot that. Turns out and to be true. true. Oh my God, it was so true. Yeah, we, we had a yeah. meeting here all oh, about a month ago. Uh huh. Uh, some people came in from all over the place. Some of them flew in, but they were uh, people that would teach. Like the one guy was uh, went to Fukushima, uh -huh. taught them how to negotiate with highly entrenched uh, bureaucrats and things. Right. And they came here, and there was this old guy here. He was like 80 something years old, quiet guy. And one of the people asked him, how much control do you think you have over life? He says, well, I've never made my heart beat once. <laughs> uh, don't you love it? Yeah, just don't a simple little it? statement yeah. like that. I've yeah. never made my heart beat once. Yeah, yeah. It, it just does it by itself. And, yeah. and, it, and looking back at my life, I, I'm so glad that I didn't get what I thought I wanted. That, you know, it, it would have made a wreck out of me and everybody else. You know, so it, I, I guess you just don't really learn that till you get older. Yes, and you know, it's it's interesting because now at this stage, you know, seventy two, and I, I just want to embrace this stage of my life fully. I want to, you know, be as conscious as I can, but not be um, so taken back or God, it'd be better if I, you know, if I didn't look like this or these wrinkles weren't here or whatever, it's like, I don't want to be bothered with that, you know? And so, yeah, it moves slower. You yeah. know, my body's morphing into something that it wasn't 25, 30 years ago. What? Hey, it's just part of it. But there's, you know, there's a beauty in the wisdom and to be able, I think, to embrace that part is, you know, is a good thing. I'm getting there. I, I'll it's be, not, a, you know, it's not so easy because I, I love Ram Das. Yeah. Love him, and a lot of times, you know, I'll I'll uh, listen to his podcasts because they're so rich. They're just so rich, and uh, you know, he's he's so correct. He said there's a lot of suffering around aging in our society. And there, you know, there really is. So this is like, and I've been thinking about that a lot. This is just like that other season. And, and there, there's know. so many ways that we can learn what you're talking about. Remember, Ram Dass was giving a talk one time. This is back in the 60s when everybody was sitting around with their Nehru shirts and white and oh, beads. I love and, him. You know, yeah. and it was a pretty big audience. And there was one little old lady there, sitting there with her little patent leather purse, and she had a oh, I remember a, a him cap on with the little cherries. And <laughs> he said, uh, as I was talking about these really far out psychotropic experiences, she kept nodding in agreement. You know, yeah. like she'd been there, she'd done that. You know, yeah. so he decided to go out there as far as he could get into the most bizarre, outlandish psychedelic cosmic experiences possible and she just gets more and more excited you know and sitting there so after the talk you know he, he says well, i just have to talk to this lady so he kept looking at her and smiling and finally she came over and 
he got together with her and he says, I have to ask you, you seem to be understanding what I'm talking about here. <laughs> What's your secret? And she looked at him and bent over sort of conspiratorially and she says, I crochet. I know, I love that. I and absolutely love that. At that point that. he says his, oh his whole God. world opened up a lot bigger. Yeah, you know? I crochet. You know, and it's just such a visual of her. Yeah, sometimes I fall asleep listening to him. It's pretty funny, but uh, I just, there's something very soothing. So I figure it's always good to go into the consciousness on some level while I'm sleeping, right? And then I've had some dreams where I'm saying, good Lord, man, take a breath, <laughs> you know, because yeah. he's talking in my sleep, in the um, you know, in the podcast. And it's like, take a breath. And I'm telling him that in, in my dream state because he's talking nonstop and, in that podcast. But I love him. I just think he's got so much to, to give and to offer. And yeah. I didn't find him until probably yeah, three years ago. I think between, really, mm -hmm. well, it's, yeah, yep. Between him and Alan Watts, they were probably the, the two Westerners that really brought back a lot of the Eastern yeah. teachings and stuff. Alan yeah, I, I remember I was starting to listen to uh, Ram Das around 69, something like that, you know. Krishnamurti, uh, Alan yeah. Watts, they were my oh. first entryway. Then that took me into Gurdjieff and Ospensky and... You know, that's a whole other realm of life. You know, it's yeah. like th these people. When when you start dealing with people that have, like yourself, that's actually been there, and walked through it, and came out of it, and is willing to talk about it, you realize the value of experience. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, the the you difference know. being, if if you if you hadn't had the experience. Right. It'd be like sitting here and you're showing me a picture of food. Right. But you've never eaten. Yeah. And there, I can't eat it either. <laughs> yeah. but, but people do this. They, I review books. And a lot of the books I review, I can tell the last 10 books that they read. They, they oh. synthesized it, combined it into their own little perception, and put it out there. There's very few novel perceptions, perceptions that are completely new. Mm. Very few. Yeah, it's you know? true. And, and that only comes with experience. Well, I, you know, it's, I love what Dr. Peoples always says. He said, the earth is a school, and our experiences are our school books. Right. And one of the, you know, one of the tools that he gives, which is really wonderful if anybody is, listening and, and uh, uh, this might be appropriate for them. But one of the things that's so helpful is to write about the experience. How has it helped me grow as a soul? How has it helped me evolve? Uh, and that way you start to own it and right. you transform it much more quickly. But I'm just, I'm incredibly grateful. I mean, I am so grateful that I went through those experiences they don't tug at me. They don't pull at me. I can talk about them very openly because it's just been part of my path. You Isn't know, it funny been... how, how that shift happens? Yeah. Like I, was in a, I was on my sailboat. My sailboat caught on fire. Oh, my gosh. And this might be, there's another aspect to this that the reason I can listen to you and I can see it as a valid point of view is because I had my own thing happen. When I was on the sailboat, Caught on fire. When was that, this? What year? Uh, 1997. Wow. And what happened is the bilge pump clicked on, and I was doing some uh, resurfacing with solvents, and it really bad. Well, and I had solvent all over my pants. Oh, my God. So I caught on fire. And it's weird, too. I'm out in the ocean, well, I, actually at the dock, but I could have jumped in the water. I had a fire extinguisher there. I could have, but I, I panicked. You know, first time I caught on fire, I guess. Sure. I have an what excuse. Did, what did you do? Well, I, at that point in my life, my, my life was going so fast and so, and I'd done so much, I dropped to the deck of the boat and I thought, you know what? Maybe it'd be okay just to give up. 
Really? Yeah. So you yeah. were yeah. at that I was right little at that teetering point. And, and some, wow. some, somebody pulled me up by the back of the neck, actually pulled me off the ground, you know? And I don't think I'm embellishing this story. Pulled me off the ground and stood me up. And I looked around and there was nobody there. Oh, okay, gosh. I didn't tell anybody about this. Nobody. Moved to Chico, 2004. Uh, a couple of years later, I Mary Kay, she's like a, a medium. Uh -huh. I, I went to see her and she's looking into, and I went to see her because I wanted to connect with my ex-wife who uh -huh. had recently died. Yeah. And uh, she says to me, she says, does your grandmother look a little bit like a witch kind of? Yeah. I said, yeah, that's my grandmother. Oh my and gosh. She yeah. says, well, she's telling you something strange. Have you been in a fire ever? Wow. I said, yeah. She says, well, she and your mom's here too. Her and your mom are telling me that they're the ones that picked you up from the fire. Does that make any sense? I had no, I didn't even tell Dara. I told nobody about this. And I said, whoa, yeah, it makes a whole, I have goosebumps. Yeah, it's a goosebumps story. It makes story. a whole lot of sense to me now. And she said, your grandmother's telling me this too. She said, she's telling me that she wished she would have loved you more. Because my oh, grandmother used to really treat me sort of bad. Yeah, you know? wow. So that told me too, that when you get on that side, oh, the awareness. a lot of the ego personality bullshit just sort of fades away and you're deep into your spirit and your heart. You know that that's a that's an incredible story. You know, thanks for sharing that with me cuz that got it was just right there with you. Do you know that experience that we were talking about kind of that in between the pause between the heartbeat or whatever. It's like that acute awareness. That's what that's like on the spirit side. There's no it, it it's like the soul has no confines to it where we're sitting here and we're confined just the concept of being in a body is is confining but it's like this my soul in that space felt as large as the united states of america i would use that as the analogy it was just huge so that's yeah, it's you know, funny and, and even for, time disappears it does and know? and for your you know your grandmother to be sharing that and with that you know that perspective from that side is so grand it's just yeah that was a gift in a lot of ways oh it gosh, healed a lot between me and my grandmother but it also uh, i am a person I, I think beliefs are great you know i don't know i came from west by god virginia where you got to believe in something boy <laughs> you know, I, I grew up that way but the older i got i realized no wait i, I don't have to believe I, I can search and validate things along the way and create a deeper understanding and, and in that understanding incorporate it into my being more. Like if you and I could sit here, we could believe that we're in Spain sure. all we want to and, and we could really see, but we're never going to get there. But if we realize, wait, we're not in Spain, we need to buy a plane ticket and we need to take steps to be there. And I, I think that's where a lot of spiritual people finally get to. And they they drop all their beliefs. And the, the moment you do that, it, it's disorientating. Oh, yeah. It's like, whoa. Because like, you're used to hanging on to this thing. That's right. But once you l let go of all that, the freedom sets in. And now you have the freedom to... Whew, yeah, explore. Yeah. And, you know, that leaves me with the more I know this, the more I know nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, what gain and, and some understanding and wisdom is nothing. I mean, it's it's all because the universe is so enormous. Uh, you can't put a concept on it, you know, so. It's just, there's, there's a part in the Bible, I think it's in Psalms, where it says a prophet is seldom recognized in their own home. Mm. And I, I recognize that with people around here. There's some amazing people here in this community, but they're only famous out there in the international scene. Sure. You know? How's that been for you with with kids and close family people and friends? 
that grew up with you? I, well, you know, I've always kept a really low radar, and this has been a real stretch for me because, you know, there was always a fear of ridicule. Public ridicule was kind of a big thing for me. But I had an experience that, uh, and I'd like to share this with you because it was kind of a, a moment that pushed me out there more. But I was in a, a mall in uh, Los Angeles, the West Side Pavilion, and a complete stranger came up to me and took her finger in my face and a very elegant woman, probably in her 60s, very well dressed. And I'll never forget, she, she said like this, she, in, in, I mean, she got really up there like that. This that finger was going right in my face. She said, your life may very well become a film or a TV movie of the week and you need to be writing. You could be helping millions of women. And when she said that to me, you know, and it wasn't the film and the TV movie thing at all, but when she said you could be helping millions of women, yeah. that's when I thought, you know what, get over the fear. Well, I, I, I think with this book, you are going to help a lot of women. I, I seen and, the, and some men, too. You yeah. know, I've had, I've had, yeah. Some I've, of your reviews are, all of your reviews are fives, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you've noticed on Amazon. But, you know, we only have uh, about five minutes left. You want to give your website and ways oh, that people you very can much. get a hold? Sure. Uh, people can get a hold of me at I am, it's I A M within, I am within dot com. And feel free to go ahead and email me. I love to hear from people. And that's it, www.iamwithin. Uh, the book can be ordered through Barnes and Noble indie stores uh, on Amazon. And then I'll also be doing a book signing on August 24th at Amazon. So. Yeah, uh, at Barnes and Noble. At Barnes and Noble here, here, here in Chico. Chico. Here in Chico, so I'm excited about so that. So the date and the time. August 24th, between um, four and six o'clock, I'll be there signing books. All right. Okay. Be wonderful. Well, so you know what, by. Athena? We're going to have to stop letting so much time go between. Mm -hmm. I, there's more so, questions I'd like to ask, but well, we'll do it again. Sometime yeah, we, we can do this again sometime. Yeah, we can and, certainly uh, cover a plethora. <laughs> of the uh, topics and well there, there, and there's another topic that we're going to get into eventually we just didn't get into it this time but the next time we will okay and you Look know at, what i'm talking about yes i do and i can see your eyes light up on yeah that yeah because that yeah. that is uh something that um, fascinates you for sure it, it's it's the biggest story never told yeah yeah and oh, everybody's yeah. talking about it yeah and it's coming out now yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for your time. And, thank um, you. You know, this has been fun, and I've just so enjoyed spending time with you. And I'm just, you know, sorry that so many years have gone by since we had connected, but here we are. Yeah. No time, it, right? It, it makes it exactly perfect. Yeah, always is. Yeah. Things happen as they are, are meant to. And yeah, congratulations. On, success of the magazine it's going yeah to yeah. some of the toughest times too. yeah well it's something yeah. good out there and it gets seeded and it takes root and there you go you know we have yeah. a lot of support from the community yeah. and yeah. our advertisers are amazing people wonderful I, I read their articles you know and sort of edit through it to make sure it's a good you know mm -hmm. I can't tell you, probably one out of three times, tears come to my eyes, just knowing yeah. that these kinds of people are spending their time and their money to be in our magazine and help people. Right. You know, it, it's, it's truly amazing. Yeah. All right, Athena. Okay. Thank and, you so and, much. Until we meet again. Until we meet again, sooner than later. Thank you. Okay.